some 30 years ago, I got an idea for a conference that would deal, that seemed to me, with a significant aspect of science fiction, and maybe even with a significant contribution to the future of the world. It must have come to me after C.P. Snow's Two Cultures lecture, and probably after I read that Carl Sagan attributed his interest in science to his early love of science fiction. I began to pick up on other ways in which science fiction and science have interrelated. Scientists who have written science fiction, scientists who have been influenced by science fiction, science fiction writers who have become scientists, and most commonly, science fiction writers who have turned scientific speculations into science fiction. Science fiction, administered at an early age, often inclines its readers toward science, sometimes as a career, even sometimes as a very important career. We know lots of examples of how that happens. Stephen Hawking was reading science fiction by the ton before his Lou Gehrig's disease illness hit him. The two Nobel laureates, Sheldon Glashow and Stephen Weinberg, who shared the 1979 award with Abdus Salam for their work on the relationship between electromagnetism and the weak force, started out at Bronx High School of Science as the editors of their science fiction pansy. Leon Letterman, the man who made Fermilab the model for all national laboratories everywhere, told me once that he, re he remembers as an 11-year-old in Brooklyn, eager eagerly waiting for each new issue, issue of Astonishing Stories, the science fiction magazine that was edited by another teenage kid from Brooklyn, namely me. The mechanism of science fiction takes these deep human implications, extracts it from the pages of physical review, and animates it for the kinds of discussions that whole cultures conduct. And this is an ongoing discussion. We're not going to get the answer in a few years, and that's the end of it. I think it's going to go on for the entire history of the human race. Notice that new models appear as soon as, as somebody can possibly think there's a variation allowed. It seems to me that there is really no thing that we can conceive of a human being doing or that we have the capability for a human being to do that some human being won't do. When we reach out with thought and imagination and bring story structures to our developing cosmological theories, we gain a sense of identity from the, from the story and the facts. And our suspected identity is not perhaps what we thought it to be. Cosmology, the fate of the Earth, the galaxy is of little significance to daily life. To those who live in an ignorance not too different from that of people prior to Copernicus and Galileo. Jurassic Park made DNA a household word and, ironically, despite the author's prophetic intentions, effectively made DNA manipulation acceptable to the public in a way that was never seen before. Compare the relatively relaxed view of gene manipulation in the United States with the rapidly anti-DNA sentiments in Europe. In my view as an educator, the enthusiastic reception of Jurassic Park had much to do with the subsequent embrace of molecular biology, particularly in America. And uh, we had a couple of American astronauts along with us, um, and I had the opportunity to sit at the lunch at once with a couple of them, and we got fairly familiar, and I, I said, uh, if you had a chance to go to Mars and you you know, there was very little likelihood that you could get back. Would you go? And both of them said immediately, like a shot, like a shot. There are people who will do that. If we met the unknown, we could sharpen our wits that way, on the unknown. And that if we went into space, we would certainly be encountering the unknown. And our wits would be consequently sharpened. So here's the big fallacy, uh, that it's, if you go to the moon, somehow that uh, you can position yourself to go to Mars. Well, it turns out that you've got to lower all this infrastructure stuff through the gravity well of the moon, which is only one-sixth. 
admittedly, but nevertheless, and then you got to boost it all out of the gravity well of the moon. So why would you want to do that? This thing. And Jack, I just wanted to ask if you have anything to add to this. Since, as I said, I seem to be at a disadvantage here. <laughs> Two English majors listening to a physicist. Well, no, I know a thing and a philosophy major with some history. I'm uh, somewhat at the opposite disadvantage that uh, Pamela Sargent described. I'm, I'm a uh, physicist and not a writer. Uh. In 1996, I proposed to my publisher as a novel about the coming changes in biology and evolutionary theory. The novel would describe an evolutionary event happening in real time, the formation of a new subspecies of human being. What I needed, I thought, was some analog to what happens in bacteria. And so I would have to invent ancient viruses lying dormant in our genome, suddenly reactivated to fairy genes and genetic instructions between humans. To my surprise, I quickly discovered I did not have to invent anything. Human endogenous retroviruses are real, and many of them have been in our DNA for tens of millions of years. What we seem to be talking about here, uh, essentially, is the meaning of life. And every time, yeah. I, every time I hear that question come up, I don't think about light years and billions of years with so many zeros on them you can't count. I think about lunch. <laughs> I also like to point out that science fiction is the literature of the human species. That is, it's a, the only literature we have which is really concerned about all of us. Not about any one of us, but about all of us. And for that reason, I think, if we're going to be concerned about the survival of the human species, or even of the survival of the impulse to seek answers to the universe, whether it's human or not, that science fiction may be the only literature that is concerned with that.